thanks everyone for coming. Um, I have to confess, when uh, Jacob first asked me to do this speech, I, I kind of groaned because I was like, no, I'm really, really trying to put lockdown behind me and move on. Um, who wants to relive, relive the years 2020 to 21? Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but to me, it, it's taken on this kind of dreamlike kind of disorientating quality, times collapsing all over the place still might have something to do with my age and um, there's this phenomenon that people now talk about as the memory hole where you can't really remember what happened when and why um, so yeah I, I'd kind of really like to wake up and move on but um, unfortunately the, the world doesn't work like that um, I think we need to make sense of that experience um, time I think allows a more dispassionate analysis of continuity and change um, so even though I was writing about lockdown all the way at the time, you know, in, in real time, trying to make sense of it, like um, I know a lot of people here were. Um, it was you know, very difficult to do that when things are kind of moving on um, in that way. And I suppose just to start with the balance that I want to, to put on this experience that we've been through um, is that it wasn't unprecedented. I mean, the, a pandemic is not an unprecedented event, and I'll come back to the concept <coughs> of unprecedented at the end of the talk. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that were noted during uh, lockdown were really accelerations of social, cultural, um, economic trends that were already there. OK, so it didn't just like completely change the world from being a really great place to being like really terrible. Um, at the same time, though, I think the event itself was very significant in and of itself. And I think the, the balance is summed up really nicely by the historian Toby Green um, in his book, The Covid Consensus the new politics of global inequality, where he says some liberals, he means people from the liberal left, have claimed that the pandemic has exposed existing inequalities, refusing to acknowledge the role of knockdowns in intensifying this process. In truth, the pandemic has exposed these inequalities in much the same way that an earthquake exposes an existing crack in the earth mm -hmm. and turns it into a chasm. <coughs> I think we can see a similar trend with the cultural battles that are coming to define our present moment um, around you know, fragmentation and polarisation, things that were, were there before COVID, there before the lockdowns, and people were talking about them. But now it often seems like a chasm has opened up between different perceptions of the world. So we, you know, we already have people talking about echo chambers, tribalised thinking, the loss of a shared democratic conversation. But I think that now has, has become much more... Um, much more significant. And one of these trends that I think that has really been accelerated uh, by the response to COVID-19 is the trend towards atomization. Um, I think we all remember the, the shock of the uh, physical social distancing that was brought in and legally enforced by you know, myriad rules over what we could do, stay home orders, forcing people to retreat into their households, the levels of fear and suspicion that were beyond the rational and I should just say, I mean, people, <laughs> it was a very rational response to be scared of this new virus when it happened. You know, so it wasn't the fear itself, but then the, the relentless promotion of fear, which led to very peculiar behaviours. Um, I mean, my, um, my favourite, well, not favourite, but, you know, I did it myself. People jumping into the road, for example, to avoid walking into each other on the pavement. You know, it's like, where's your risk calculation there, you numpty, I said to myself. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what happened to community life? You know, clubs, churches, pubs, all closed down. And then when they reopened, forced to reopen in a way that was really strained and artificial. Um, so I think that the physical social distancing was, was very significant, but possibly more significant was the, the psychic or empathetic distancing. And I'm using those terms in the sociological sense. Um, I'm using the term psychic uh, in the sense of relating to the soul or the mind. I mean, so not psychological, not mental health, but there's more that kind of sense of people's distance from each other. And empathy, um, I'm using in the Weberian sense of Vestayan, um, understanding how others interpret events and give them meaning, right, which I think is very important and something that is really being lost at the moment. To, to gain a sense of empathy requires a lot of curiosity and hard work, very different to the lazy sort of I feel your pain thing that is often talked about as empathy today. Um, and I think there's a real sort of sense of a struggle at the moment for people to really understand where other people are coming from. The distancing that happened within uh, community and infinite life 
um, was yeah, it's made worse in a way by uh, the, f the fact that it was connected to the breaking down of boundaries between personal and intimate life and the cultural and media narratives that frame the whole event. Again, people have talked about this in relation to uh, just the amount and the, 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 the quality of the, the news media and the social media that went on at the time. And I think um, Slavoj Žižek, um, in his, his book Pandemic 2, um, which is as kind of weird and wacky as Pandemic 1, but it's, it's quite good fun. Um, <laughs> and he, he says something quite interesting. He says, physical distancing as a defence against the threat of contagion has led to intensified social connectivity, not only within quarantine families, but outside of them, mostly through digital media. And outbursts of physical closeness, raves, partying, etc., have erupted in relation to both. The message of the rave is not just bodily closeness, but also less social control and thus much more distance from society at large. What happened with the pandemic was not a simple shift from communal life to distancing, but a more complex shift from one constellation of closeness and distancing to another. The fragile balance between communal life and the private sphere, characteristic of pre-pandemic society, is replaced by a new constellation in which the diminishing of space for actual bodily social interaction due to quarantines, etc., doesn't lead to more privacy, but gives birth to new norms of social dependency and control. Don't forget that even drones were, were deployed to control us in quarantine. Now, what you have emerging from this time was a sort of what looked like the sort of two tribes of lockdown. Um, that sense of having two very different ways of understanding what was going on and how to calibrate the response to it and what should be done and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, which I found particularly troubling because it seemed to me less a situation of disagreement where you could argue over what way was better and more of just mutual incomprehension. You know, people just not understanding the way that other people were, were, were seeing these things. Um, in reality, I think what, what you had was a much more sort of fragmented kind of response that then became scripted into this, this notion of these different narratives. But when you, you, you had kind of, for example, you had the libertarian critique of lockdown, right? The, you know, an objection to the state having all these controls in our everyday life. You had the kind of liberal left critique, which not that many people on the liberal left were very outspoken about, but this is where, for example, Toby Green's coming from which um, where, where the, the horror of lockdown, as they saw it, was this kind of, as this form of blinkered self-protectionism. You know, the, this idea, yeah, lockdown protected the laptop class with very little regard for um, its impact on others. Uh, for example, poor people living in cramped housing, children, um, societies in the global south where, uh, as an Indian colleague put it to me at the, right at the start of the whole thing, she said, you know, social distancing is a luxury in India. <laughs> you don't just choose to do it. So you had that sort of critique. But that wasn't the only way that people interpreted the lockdown. Some saw it, it quite genuinely, certainly to begin with, um, as a sense that society was coming together to protect the vulnerable and also to protect itself as a society. And some welcomed... Uh, what they saw as this brief suspension of individual desires and the norms of everyday life and the mobilisation around a common cause. And I think yeah, one quote that um, I, I think sums this up quite nicely is from Matthew Paris, uh, writing in The Times on the 4th of June this year. And he's talking, he's basically lamenting the kind of fragmented commonality in British society at the moment around the Platinum Jubilee and, and he's kind of lamenting the culture wars. And Paris, who was you know, actually quite a, 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 a trenchant critique of, of the lockdowns, um, he acknowledges that, he says, you know, in his own view, there, were, there was also something, another way of looking at it. He said, a brief but blessed interruption to all of this was during the COVID lockdown when, however naively, most joined in a collective bow to our demigod NHS, variously clapping or displaying flags. Whatever one may think of the appropriateness of health provision as an object of national worship, there was something undeniably moving about the moments of unity this brought us, yet something chilling in the reflection that fear was the spur. Now, I didn't share that reaction to the NHS crack clap. I found it deeply horrible. But I know that a lot of people did, you know, and that's the, that's the thing. There's, there's no telling how, 
people interpreted these things, and there are different ways of looking at them. So we have to understand that people didn't relate to the pandemic in a uniform way, I think, and that caricaturing lockdown supporters as selfish individualists or conformist sheeple is no more accurate than caricaturing sceptics as reckless covidiots or lunatic anti-vaxxers. These are scripts that have been posed after the event on quite a diverse range of uh, experiences and positions. And on balance, I would say that the main problem revealed by the pandemic wasn't primarily one of attitudes, behaviours or even state actions. Uh, what it revealed was a crisis of meaning wrought by an intensification of fragmentary trends in all domains of life. Uh, from the economy to international relations, society, culture, personal life and relations between the generations. These trends have been evident for some years. Um, as Putnam writes in his introduction to Bowling Alone, uh, he talks about the, you know, the de declensionist narratives and how these have been a, a discussion for a long time. But I think that what, we, what, what you're seeing now is a real acceleration into a new epoch with significant consequences for how we relate to ourselves and each other. Now, atomization um, as a, a feature of a modern society isn't in new. It's a founding problem for sociology. Uh, Durkheim talked about anime. Marx talked about alienation. Tony has talked about Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, that is, the, the tension between community and society. Uh, Christopher Lash later on talked about the the emergence of a minimal self, um, you know, later in the, the 20th century, a selfhood constituted around fear and the project of survivalism. Parady theorised uh, the concept of degraded subjectivity uh, to capture how um, political agency had been diminished in a culture of fear. Um, sociologists such as Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck uh, saw it more positively, really, where they talked about individualisation and risk society and talked about this, you know, the, the, this being the, the changing um, uh, way in which the, you know, the individual related to society. Uh, Fukuyama wrote of the great, disru great disruption to relations of trust precipitated, he says, by the upheavals of the 60s. So lots of people have written about this stuff, and I have to say, I'm afraid, I think bowling alone is really boring. I think it's, it's the least interesting to me of all of these insights. I mean, it's really focused on the institutional decline and engagement with formal, or lack of engagement, with formal processes of politics. It's very 1990s when you read it now. Um, and uh, actually, you can read it as a recipe for how to make things worse. I mean, if you look at Putnam's solutions in the conclusion, they're all about how to rejuvenate social capital by instrumentalising intimate and social relationships. I mean, he's basically providing a, a recipe for what is now called woke capitalism and the therapeutic state, you know, the bringing in of values to, you know, uh, corporate and, and state life. And uh, the fact that a lot of those solutions have already been put in motion, I think, is part of the problem now, that those embedded solutions were already there by the time we entered into the COVID-19 pandemic. In his conclusion, Putnam writes, however, uh, just to have a go, uh, <laughs> creating, I really don't like Robert Putnam, uh, creating or recreating social capital is no simple task. It would be eased by a palpable national crisis, like a war or depression or natural disaster. But for better and for worse, America at the dawn of the new century faces no such galvanising crisis. The ebbing of community over the last several decades has been silent and descriptive. Well, be careful what you wish for. Uh, so, new historical epoch. Now, this morning, uh, the sessions uh, this morning discussed the problem of history and the political ramifications uh, of our current predicament. This session, I'm just going to focus on one very specific um, aspect of this phenomenon. Well, my computer just decides to die, but it doesn't matter because I've got it on paper as well. <sighs> you try, don't you? Um, which is the transformation of the pandemic into a problem of generations. Now, I should say, I'm not, only, I'm not talking about this just because it's what I uh, know about, although that's always useful when giving a lecture. Um, but, um, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that this is the whole story of atomization. Um, but I think um, it really illustrates one uh, crucial aspect, um, which has been accelerated and ex accentuated in the past couple of decades. Um, so the discussion of the pandemic and the generational contract 
represents, I would say, a deepening crisis about the relationship between the past, present and the future, which is embodied within generations of people. So this is a crisis that isn't just an abstract crisis of thought, but it's embodied in the relationships that are currently most important in giving a sense of continuity, stability and meaning. Okay, so just to outline a bit about what, what are generations, I mean, this is a whole big discussion which I won't go into, but it's important to understand that when we're talking about generations, we're not just talking about old and young people, and we're not talking about sort of pre-existing cohorts that just exist, right? You know, baby boomers, millennials, all these labels that people use. These are constructs that social scientists have made up to understand the moment. Um, they're not just things that just appear. Um, generations are best understood as concepts of existence, um, so as ways in which societies give meaning to the relationship between history and biography. Um, it's a way of expressing yeah, how big developments that happen, um, how these are um, absorbed and affected um, by those coming to adulthood in a particular time and place. Uh, that's a particular aspect of generational theory. And it speaks to a relationship between social and personal time, which can result in a particular kind of generational consciousness, that is, the orientation of young people to events that is distinct from the orientation that um, older people or people younger than the young people might have. And so what you've got is history mediated through intimate relationships between the generations, especially at the level of family and, educa uh, family and education. The construction of the pandemic as a generational problem, um, I think, really follows a, lo a lot of the current rhetoric that I've been writing about for some time, um, about uh, so-called generational conflict in policy and politics, which is underpinned by a deeper unease about the relationship between the past, present and future. The sense of a temporal rupture in which the past appears to offer, at best, an unhelpful guide to the future, and at worst, and this is really the trend at the moment, uh, an obstructive barrier to the realisation of historical progress. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit about Karl Mannheim because he was the sociologist who wrote the, uh, wrote the seminal essay on the sociology of generations. Um, and I, think, I, I still think his account pro properly captures uh, what, um, what is useful for all its problems, what is useful about the concept for, for understanding uh, this situation. So he, um, his essay, The Problem of Generations, was uh, one in, uh, it was the last actually, in a set of essays about the sociology of knowledge. Um, so he wasn't talking about how people, he wasn't talking about age groups particularly, he wasn't talking about how people experience the world. He was talking about knowledge and meaning, how a society understands itself and its history, and how knowledge is constructed and reconstructed over time. By theorising the significance of generations within the transmission and development of knowledge, Mannheim's contribution provided a framework for understanding the relationship uh, sorry, understanding the emergence of generational consciousness in relation to wider social and cultural events. Um, in a nutshell, what he said is that what we know about the world cannot be decoupled from how we come to know it. So society's accumulated cultural heritage is not something static that is simply passed down. Um, it's continually transmitted to and refreshed by new participants in the cultural pro process who make fresh contacts with our society. Because of this, people born at a particular point in history embody and internalise the experience of their time. But they don't do this in the same way as those who came before them. So consciousness is developed within and informed by the experience of coming, age, coming of age in a particular time and place. Um, hence why the subtitle to the book that Emma and I wrote was uh, Coming of Age in a Crisis. When Mannheim was talking about generational location, you know, what it meant to be part of a generation. He made an analogy to uh, social class in the sense that, you know, a generation isn't something you choose to join. Uh, it's something that you're born into, whether you like it or not. Um, this is worth saying because Mannheim made that an analogy and that's led a lot of people to then say, oh, well, you see, he said generation was like social class and then has become an argument to say, well, let's have generational politics instead of class politics, right? This is why people should read the things that they're quoting before they actually <laughs> quote them. Um, and Mannheim was actually saying something uh, really quite different. He said that class is socially constituted 
based on the existing, existence of a changing economic and power structure in society, whereas generation location is based on the existence of biological rhythm in human existence, the factors of life and death, a limited span of life and ageing. So relations between members of the same generation, individuals born at the same time, are significant as they have a common, relation, common location in the historical dimension of the social process. So this is about sort of the, the relationship between temporality um, and, and people. But relations between different generations are vital in ensuring cu cultural continuity, and these aren't constituted by social dynamics alone. So what he says is, while the nature of class location can be explained in terms of economic and social conditions, generation location is determined by the way in which natural patterns, uh, the way in which certain patterns of experience and thought tend to be brought into existence by the natural data of the transition from one generation to another. In other words, it's the relationship between biology and history that we're talking about here. And I think the emphasis on the biological foundations of generation uh, and the emphasis that Mannheim placed on continuity becomes particularly important um, as a question to consider now when um, sex, you know, as in you know, your sex, but also the act of procreation are being uh, queried or queered. The generational transaction, I would say, is no longer being taken for granted. Um, it's worth also stressing the importance that he placed on relationships between the generations, because ideas of social generations, which is what's attributed to Mannheim, um, tend to emphasise the differences, right? And this is what we see in discussions of culture, the difference between baby boomers and millennials and Gen Z and Z, whatever. Um, and they tend to sort of pull out the differences in outlook between those cohorts. Um, Mannheim actually said, you know, he regarded the, the friction between older and younger generations largely as a feature of intergenerational collaboration rather than a feature of generational conflict. Okay, so just in normal times, um, then you, you would, um, because the relationship between the generations is continuous, spontaneous and often informal, um, and the fact that generations are in a state of constant interaction, um, yeah, the fact that new participants in the cultural process are being born all the time and people are dying all the time, um, he says that generations generally de develop a sensitivity to one another. He's got this quote that I use all the time with my students, and it's true, actually. Not only does the teacher educate his pupil, but the pupil educates his teacher too. Um, within intimate life as well, much of what young people know about the world is absorbed unconsciously. It's just as the way things are. But there's something significant about the coming of age moment. Because, um, he says, as the young person matures and, he says, personal experimentation with life begins, they gain the possibility of really questioning and reflecting upon things. And so this is the point at which a young, uh, the, the point of coming of age, this is the point at which tensions between the generations potentially can come to the fore. But whether they re erupt into something more significant, creating something that uh, later theorists and commentators, commentators would describe as a generation gap, depends on wider social forces operating at that time and the interaction between the pace of social change and the cohorts coming to maturity. So what's being said here is that the, a distinctive generational consciousness doesn't arise simply from the passage of time, right? As is often implied by this kind of, you know, these sort of generationist narratives you see all the time about, um, <coughs> you know, the ways that millennials and Generation Z or Zoomers relate to social media, this really facile notion of, ah, oh, right, there's a, there's a gap, there's a gap. Um, in gen generation gaps are actually quite rare. Um, the, the emergence of the potential for a generation gap is the outcome of wider social and cultural conflict. And this is, happens at a point when the knowledge and the experience of the past come starkly into tension with the present day. So Mannheim says that the emergence of an actual generation um, involves more than mere co-presence at a particular time and place. Right? It, what it requires is participation in the common destiny of this historical and social unit during a process of dynamic destabilisation. And it's during situations of dynamic de destabilisation, which are provoked by accelerated social change, um, that can result in a shared consciousness amongst 
those coming into adulthood. As young people, he says, being closer to the problems of their time, are dramatically aware of a process of destabilisation and take sides in it. And this can also result in a schism with uh, older generations because older generations then cling to the reorientation that had been the drama of their youth. Is this making sense? Yeah, yeah. good. Okay. Phew. Um, right, so the... <coughs> right, good. I'll right, move on. So what can generations help us to understand? I think nuanced understandings of generations um, can have an important role to play in understanding our, our current historical moment and its implications with the future. Now, this is less to do with the experience of the pandemic itself than with the meaning our societies have attributed to it as a so-called unprecedented event requiring a decisive break from the social, economic and cultural conventions that have hitherto framed our social existence. The upheavals provoked by the pandemic were no mere historical blip after which everything could return to normal. I mean, I think that's, that's evident now. It wasn't at the time. It was conceivable that we could have had that and then think, but obviously now we're, we're seeing a much wider kind of process of dynamic destabilisation, as Mannheim would have it. Um, these upheavals represented a much wider process of accelerated social change uh, in which wider social forces would come force forcefully into conflict creating a schism between the past and the present, and then obviously with implications for the future. It is worth stressing that the pandemic and the globalised response of lockdowns and their national variants um, didn't itself cause that rupture. I mean, th th there is a tendency to kind of blame lockdown for everything, right, which we should resist. I mean, th th these things were the outcome of all the kind of tensions that have been building for decades. But the extreme character of the social response, with its implications for national economies, education systems, democracies, health services, and established <coughs> ways of life, consolidated and accelerated trends towards polarisation. And I think based on this, well, you could, we, you could reasonably suggest that um, <coughs> this historical moment that we're living through may well give rise to an actual generation and therefore the potential of a generation gap to emerge. In the way that, I mean, all my previous writings, I said, you know, I critiqued the idea that there were these big generation gaps. But I think that now it has that, that, that potential um, for that kind of uh, clash to emerge. Um, the events of 2020 and beyond represent a new epoch far more significant than um, the way that other people have described uh, changes, to, um, uh, sort of changes to generational experience. And one of the things that I think was particularly significant was the all-encompassing character of lockdowns and the disorganisation of social life that happened around that time. So this wasn't like you know, young people could just go, oh yeah, I'm just ignoring that and I'm going to go and do something else. You know, the, the lockdowns had a huge impact on how peer groups related to each other, and how generations related to each other. Um, the, the disruption of social time and the upheaval of taking for granted ways of living and interacting gave social distancing measures an intimate quality that impacted every dimension of life for actually a substantial period. Um, and I think this, this had a particular impact on those coming of age at the time, largely because any idea of a future tra trajectory or milestones or all the things that have been built in to young people's lives as pathways towards adulthood uh, were just sort of disappeared, <laughs> you know, in a cloud of anxiety about the present. So Frank earlier talked about presentism. I mean, this is what we had, two years of operating around a present day emergency. What was particularly significant was the closure of schools and universities as core institutions of education and socialisation. Um, followed by kind of attempts to sort of substitute online learning of curriculum content. I mean, something that was in no way the same <laughs> as what you might say is the project of education. And I think, uh, you know, that, that raised profound questions um, about the value that our current society attaches to the transmission of the accumulated cultural heritage to young people. Minutes, okay, nearly done. Um, I mean, you know, you saw this in the, the discussions that purported to be about education, uh, really fixated on, for example, what we're going to do about grades for exams, yeah, make them up, 
Yes, that was the. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, but, but there was all this discussion about grades, but not about what, what kids had learned. There was little conception of education as a moral project, um, as something that shows the exercise of adult responsibility for its young and for society as a whole. So I think what, you, what you've got is the potential of this moment to um, fuel a trend that I've described before as um, a trend towards generational distancing. And again, this isn't new. Uh, it's something that um, the Centre for Parenting Culture Studies, led by Ellie Lee, has worked on for a long time. So the, you know, the, the attempt to sort of reconfigure parenting away from what your mother knew or your grandmother knew around the kind of expert advice of the, the um, present day. Um, Frank Ferrodi's book, uh, Paranoid Parenting, which inspired the work of the centre, um, in that book he talked about the emptying out of adult identity through the kind of giving away of the authority of uh, parenting to expert advice. And um, his recent book, 100 Years of Identity Crisis, explores that in depth. Uh, we see it in these constant debates raging at the moment about education and the culture wars, debates around sex and relationships, education, um, and socialisation into a particular set of values. Um, so I think um, what really kind of sums up the, 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 the way that the, the pandemic catalyzed this was that the promotion of this moment as an unprecedented threat requiring an unprecedented response dealt a symbolic blow to the transaction between the generations. Because how can older generations pass on what they know about life when everything they know is deemed irrelevant to the current state of crisis? So just to conclude, um, I think we have two, probably more, anyway, two big problems with how we, we try and process the experience of the, the uh, the, of lockdowns now. I think one, you know, we can still see a failure to really grapple with the implications of the global response to the pandemic and what led to it. You know, this idea that we can just sort of let it all go and go, let's go back to the 1990s where everything was great. A bigger problem in a way is the, the way it's become a catch-all expl explanation for everything that has gone wrong. Um, I refer to Zizek again, uh, drawing on Freud. Um, he says, the pandemic is today a master signifier or as Claudio Magdalene puts it, a tyrant of our thoughts. Like all tyrants, it wants that we don't talk about anything else than itself. Bear in mind Zizek was writing during the pandemic, but still. Um, this master signifier is overdetermined by a whole series of interconnected real life facts and processes, today's riders of the apocalypse, that form its dream content. Not only the reality of the health crisis, but also the ecological crisis, global warming, the effects of deep sea pollution and mining, etc., economic crisis, unemployment, threats of widespread hunger, new waves of social unrest bringing many countries to the edge of civil war, international tensions that can easily interrupt into war, and of course the mental health crisis. In short, the pandemic functioned as a kind of detonator that exploded already existing tensions in our society. And the problem with that kind of apocalyptic master narrative is it tends to short circuit debates around specific issues, I think, and forms the basis for a sort of, I called it a techno-utopian solution, but I, I prefer the concept of magical thinking that Frank brought up earlier. This, this idea of how to start from scratch from like using a year zero approach um, on the basis of um, using something that was unprecedented as the way of constructing a kind of a new normal based on a technocratic management processes. Um, or, as Phil put, Mullen put it uh, in a recent article for Spike, just lurching from one crisis to another, which is what we have if we always feel that we're confronted with uh, unprecedented events. So in terms of how to address this, I haven't got any solutions, unfortunately, other than I think we should be very wary of evasive explanations and solutions, such as our predicament is all about lockdown and our predicament has nothing to do with lockdown. I think we really need to engage in a serious conversation with our past and our future, particularly focusing on the moral responsibility of adults to children and doing the work to gain a genuine sense of empathy in the sense of Vestayan uh, to move beyond these sort of uh, stereotype positions that are attributed to people. So we need to deal with the cultural problems as cultural problems rather than transforming them into an idea of a problem of generations.